Hello and welcome back to the Football Diary podcast where it's almost time. We're here at the final. Two games of football left to play. One of them is that irrelevant third versus fourth playoff that I can't imagine many people will care too much about. Unless you're Moroccan, then I reckon there's uh, there's everything riding on that. But the final is upon us and we have our two teams. Argentina will face France on Sunday to see if France can retain the title or if Messi can finally get his hands on the trophy he's always coveted. So I'm here with Dave today to discuss those two teams and what the likelihood of either of them winning the final is. Thanks for joining me, Dave. How are you? Very good, thank you. Disappointed to see the back of this tournament? It's In ways, it feels like it's flown, but also it feels like it's been dragging a bit. I feel like it feels like it's been dragging more so since England went out. <laughs> Funny that, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll be back together to review the tournament as a whole once it's all done. But for now, let's preview that final then, Dave. France and Argentina. First things first, is that the two best sides of this competition? I don't think it's the two best sides. I think if France can go all the way in this competition, if they win this competition, I think this is their best World Cup because... They've done it, in my opinion, with a lot of key players out injured. They've obviously had to rotate. Um, certain players have obviously got injured as well during the tournament. If they can win this World Cup, I think it'll be their best achievement, really. Um, a lot, they've had a little bit of luck along the way. Probably some of them, the big teams have obviously got knocked out, the likes of Brazil, uh, who you thought have probably gone a bit deeper in the tournament. Argent, this Argentina team for me, it's it almost looks like it's written in the stars for them. I think, and um, the way it's set up, obviously, a Messi, Messi's looked a lot more of his his old self. You know, obviously, the last couple of seasons, probably a lot of a lot of people have said, "Oh, has he lost the spark?" But he's, you know, he's he's always been there in in the big moments, and um, well, I suppose we'll see what he can do uh, in the final and. I'm sure a lot of people will be hoping it's the reverse of the last World Cup final we were involved in. <laughs> I don't know if I'm included in that, to be honest. It's funny seeing these two get there because it took Argentina some time to get started in this tournament. We obviously remember that they started with a loss to Saudi Arabia. And you're right with France, missing some key players has given them a bit of a setback at times. But this squad that all of a sudden lacks a bit of depth in terms of tournament football, shows the depth that France as a nation have because some players that you might not have expected it have really come to the forefront. I look at the likes of Griezmann, who has been a, a regular in that France team for so long now. I think it's, what, 76 games in a row? But all of a sudden, he's playing as a central midfielder and absolutely shining. Chouamani comes in. He's been brilliant. Tio Hernandez replaces his brother. And he's been brilliant. So they keep stepping up to that next level. So although... A lot of people might say it's Argentina's fate to win this. I think the fact that France have overcome kind of quite a lot of adversity in their squad. They've lost the likes of Benzema and Cuckoo. Uh, Kimpembe is out injured. Pogba, Kante. That's a really impressive run to the final. And they beat England on the pro in the process as well. So it wasn't exactly easy for them. Is there an element of they've been here and done that, this group of players? So when it comes to the big game, the pressure's almost off them a little bit. Whereas it will be really on Argentina because it feels like that last dance for Messi. Do you think that, that weighs into their thinking at all? We've been here four years ago. It's going to be easier for us. I suppose, yeah, there's obviously some experienced players in there who've had a bit of a, a feel for it. and But obviously, let's not forget, there's a lot of new new names in that lineup who weren't in the team, obviously, the last time they won the competition. So, But yeah, there'll be obviously some old heads in there who'll be able to give them a, a bit of guidance. I do feel as though the onus will be on Argentina to really take this game by the scruff of the neck because in the last, if you look at the last couple of games that France have been involved in, they've obviously taken the lead, kind of sat back and been happy to kind of sit on it and hit teams on the break and pick their moments when to kind of attack teams. And that's worked for them. Obviously, a lot of people are slating mm. them, obviously saying it's not the easiest on the eye. Um, but you can't knock it if they're getting results and they're winning you know, trophies. So um, I do feel as though it will be there for Argentina if they can win it and if they're good enough to pick France apart. Um, obviously, whether they are, it's, you know, get to the season, I suppose we'll find out. 
Well, let's unpick their semi-finals then and look at what each team will be targeting in the other and what we might see come true in this one. Obviously, you mentioned then about France's style, so we'll start with them. They really did look like they were sitting back and waiting for their opportunity against Morocco. And it was very similar against England too. So that's two games in a row, really, where a France team where you would have said their weak areas might be in midfield and defence have relied on their midfield and defence to do all the hard work and then relied on moments from their attackers rather than taking the game to teams. We really saw that against Morocco, didn't we, Dave? Where really it came down to when France got their opportunities, they were going to take them. But they let Morocco come on to them quite a lot. Does that give you any worries for them in the final? It doesn't surprise me that Morocco were unable to score, even though there were obviously a couple of really yeah. close moments where you know you, it, you couldn't really explain how they hadn't scored. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I can I can see what you're saying. I think they were kind of teetering on the edge of playing with fire, really, France at times. And, uh, mm. But we've seen it in the rest of this competition. Morocco didn't just have that final. That final um, cutting edge that they needed in those, you know, that final third. And you, there were so many almost moments where the moves, some of the football they were playing at times was mesmerising, deserved to be finished off, but they just couldn't get that goal. But France in that first five minutes, yeah. it was almost like a punch. It, there was a lot, there was an air of naivety, I think, about Morocco in the first five, ten minutes where it almost looked like France could get in behind them again and score another goal. Was part of that naivety starting with Roman Saiz when he clearly didn't look fit? Yeah, I think, but you could put you could put that down as well. Obviously, he came off very early in the game, didn't he? As well, so mm. you kind of just thought, really, should that be a decision that should have been made before the game? With with the experience he's got as a defender, really, are you? You should be thinking maybe I'm actually harming my team more than doing any good for, for my team if mm. if I'm not hundred um, percent, which clearly he wasn't, and he didn't look it actually in in the previous game um, either. And um, in the end, it, that sort of naivety, I feel like that tournament experience did actually show through um, with France mm. and the goal albeit a little bit a little bit fortunate the first one and um, with the deflection it fell so kindly to hernandez didn't it who finished it really well um so i, I don't think you can kind of knock them too much morocco that this tournament they've done so brilliantly and i it's they've surprised a lot of people aren't they really yeah, definitely. And it really did seem like they were that top level striker away from actually maybe going further. There were so many moments where I was screaming at them, get into the six yard box where a player would take the ball out wide and cut the ball back. And there was just no one around to try and finish it. No one gambling or making that run into the box that you'd expect them to. And that really stood out to me that if there was a striker that was willing to get on the end of a pass, that might have helped them. But the other thing that really stood out to me was how easily players dribbled through France's midfield and defence. Players were allowed to carry the ball 30 yards at the pitch. Amrabat had so much success by just picking the ball up in the middle and driving, driving forward. So France are weak to a player picking up the ball and dribbling with it. And weak to a decent number nine. On the other side of the coin, you have Argentina, who just got through their semi-final, with Julian Alvarez playing up front and getting two goals, being very clinical in doing so, and Messi carrying the ball past defenders and midfielders. Is that a perfect matchup for the Argentinian forwards after the back of what we saw against Morocco? I think it makes for an exciting game. I think whatever way you look at it, really, is that I think that's the way France are going to look at trying to win this game in, in moments like they have the last couple of games um, in the knockouts and obviously they hit teams on the break where obviously the likes of Mbappe is going to come you know into the game and Argentina obviously trying to win the game in, a, in an attacking way um, the likes of Messi and the movement that he kind of creates around him as well so it's definitely going to be an exciting encounter and I can't wait for it to, to be honest I, I wasn't so much looking forward to the semi-finals because I kind of Imagine that this this would be the final, really. I was yeah. I was in I was yeah. kind of curious to see how Morocco would perform, but I just thought they'd fall fall a little bit short in uh, in that attacking area where they couldn't. We've just not seen them be clinical enough in the tournament. Mm. Uh, it's kind of understandable. Mm. We've not really got a recognised number nine like you mentioned. Uh, you can finish for them. 
So yeah, I mean, El Nasiri yeah. is a funny one, isn't he? He got his yeah, goal yeah. against Portugal, but he's he's not he's not lit up La Liga either. It's he it was never going to be the player to hang your hopes on in a World Cup. But for them to have even got into the third versus fourth place uh, playoff on Saturday is when... such an achievement. There was a chance where. Was it Elzen El Naziri who went on that brilliant run, and you're just thinking, shoot, he was on his left foot about for about four or five seconds. I don't think it was. Do me in, do me in, and it, it just never. I he think never it was the, the player shot. that came on for him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just, and that was the biggest difference because then at the other end, I think both the semi-finals were decided by moments of brilliance by the star players, and we'll talk about that in a second as a clash for the final. But even the second France goal. Mbappe did the opposite. He got the ball, turned, ran, 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 and he did take his shot. And it happens to the gamble and trickle forward to, to a French player. And that's what can happen. Morocco just looked nervous to do that at times. And that really stood out to me. Argentina won't be nervous about taking their chances. That's what they'll be looking to create more often. So I do wonder whether this will pose a really big test for France. I don't know if Argentina's forwards look at that France defence and are nervous about it, particularly when there's reports today that Upper Meccano might still be out ill and now Varane and Canate might be ill too. So you've got William Saliba in there. And then short of that, I don't, I don't really know who plays centre-back for France because they've already lost Lucas Hernandez. Obviously, Kimpembe couldn't make the tournament. So it's going to be interesting to see who France actually line up with, isn't it? I think they're going to be forced to potentially field a player who's not 100%. Um, mm. And obviously that's not ideal, but let's be honest, it's going to be a risk either way. If you're having to play maybe a midfielder in, in at centre-back. Uh, yeah. So I, I hope that really, for the sake of the game, that you know that there's not an, not an issue with, or limited issue with, illness because that would be a real shame really if that's how how it ended yeah definitely so on the other side of the, of the final obviously is argentina who got through their semi-final with croatia very comfortably france obviously had their backs against the walls every now and again argentina certainly didn't croatia i think we can say we're, we're quite awful <laughs> In that semi-final, it was very, very easy for Argentina to cut through them. And they did on multiple occasions. They made players who have been in the team of the tournament, really, look very, very average. It was the best we've seen of Argentina so far. So they've really grown into it. What is that momentum enough that will get them through the final? The fact that they have come off the back of a really good semi-final performance. That will give them a lot of hope, won't it? Oh, yeah, you've got to say it's probably... Their best performance so far, maybe easily. Um, I thought Croatia were quite naive, especially with some of the, the experienced players they've got in some moments. I think they let their frustration get the better, better of them as well. I thought the referee was terrible at times um, in some of the mm. decisions he was making. Um, I feel like in this tournament, I feel like a lot of refs have been trying to let you know things go as well, like not not reluctant to show yellow cards at certain moments when you just think it's a blatant mm. it's a blatant yellow card. The, play, the amount of times that players have been getting pulled back or the shirt's pulled and it's just kind of a, one of those little tactical fouls where you'd, you'd expect it to be yellow card, it's not been given. And I can imagine that's really mm. frustrating as a player um, to kind of obviously go through that. And it's, look, it obviously affected... Um, <laughs> we don't want to speak too much about England, but obviously it happened a lot in the England-France game. Um, but, yeah, I just feel as though Croatia, for the first goal, Modric gives the ball, ball away, which you don't see happen very often. Um, in no, field. yeah. And, obviously, there was a bit of controversy about the penalty. I'm not too sure myself. Um, yeah, what do you think? Do you give that as a penalty then, Dave? I think it's a bit harsh. I, I Only because... Obviously, knocks the ball past the goalkeeper one way, but then the goalkeeper doesn't even try to literally stop him. It's almost like you could maybe say an obstruction, but he stood there. He's not running towards the player, and the player runs into him. So I don't understand how you can give that as a foul for a penalty. Well, he's he's like, he's, he's run out in the first place to try and close the player down. So in that sense, you have to say he's moving towards the ball. That is him trying to make a challenge. 
and he gets no contact on the ball. Whether he takes the player out afterwards in a in another action or whether he's just in the player's way, I I I kind of I was really surprised by the fact that people were annoyed about this one because I watched that and thought it's a stonewall penalty. He's not the ball past the keeper. The keeper's missed it and he's taking him out. But there was a lot of people on your side too saying that actually that the refs were in clearly Argentina's favour and things, which I thought was a bit mad to be honest. I think it's one of those, isn't it, really? If you had that go against you, you know, if you had that go against you for Villa, you'd feel a bit aggrieved. But if you had that... <laughs> oh, I always do with Villa. <laughs> you <take that. laughs> I think it's one of them, yeah, you kind definitely. of... I'd 50-50 on it, really. Um, but yeah. it's not the worst one. It's not. It wasn't as bad as the... I don't want to go back to it now, because I've already spoken about Morocco, but that, that one was ridiculous. No, I was going to ask... I was actually going to say that to you. I was going to ask. Yeah, there was a, a more interesting decision in the other game, let's say, where it was Teo Hernandez, wasn't it, on um, yeah. Sofi and Buffal, where <laughs> Hernandez seems to kind of lose control of the ball in his own box and go back for it in the process, just completely clears Sofi and Buffal out and Buffal was booked for some reason. I'm glad that you said that that was ridiculous. That kind of saves me in my next question. Of that, I really, I was, that was a penalty was just, to Morocco, wasn't it? I don't know if I was more surprised that Buffal didn't actually stay down injured. Because if he'd have made a big, oh, a big deal of that, I, d- I don't think... I don't even know if VAR did look at it, to be honest. I don't. I don't there wasn't Apparently. anything in the... In, you know. Uh, yeah. Ah. I was dumbfounded no, by that. It was a penalty, wasn't it? Definitely. Yeah, the fact they booked that. him for it as well. What what were they booking him for? <laughs> Just being a it player. It made me laugh because the commentary, the commentary team didn't even talk about it after. None of none of them just said, you know, that what what's going on there? Surely that's a foul. <laughs> I really noticed that. And do you know what? I'm I'm not a big conspiracy guy, but I will say throughout the tournament, things have really fallen in both France and Argentina's favour very often. And you need that bit of luck sometimes to get you through a tournament, but it has been very noticeable with those two sides. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, yeah, I'm not going to jump on the conspiracy bandwagon, but yeah, they, they have benefited <laughs> from a couple of decisions, let's say that. <laughs> so Argentina's game then, was this a real coming-of-age performance from Julian Alvarez? Because he obviously has two goals to his name, one of them beautifully created by Messi. The way that he, he dribbled past Gradiol, who's been probably the best centre-back in the tournament, it looked like he dribbled past him about 18 times. And I'm still not really sure what he did wrong at any point. As a defender, you kept trying to show Messi outside. He stood his ground. He didn't rush in with a, with a challenge. And Messi still managed to get past him somehow. But for the first goal, the sheer determination of Alvarez, that's something Argentina have perhaps lacked in tournaments gone by. Higuain, for example, never scores that goal, let's be honest. Lautaro Martinez, who I thought would have a great tournament, he's not really looked up to it in in this round of of fixtures. But Alvarez, on the other hand, he starts a World Cup final now, surely, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, no doubt. If if he doesn't, I'm sure Argentina fans will be up in arms about if if, um, they decide to put uh, Martinez in instead. Um, Just the impact he's had and his movement, he, you know, he's, he offers that bit of pace as well on the break. And, the, the, for, yeah, for his first goal, wow, he just slalomed through the defence. Obviously, I'd probably had a little bit of luck, but he finished it really well. And you can't really go mm. back from this, can you? He's, I think he's got to start. And going on, speaking of Messi, it's, you say about how, how many times he went past the defenders, but he's the sort of player that some attackers, some defenders will wait for you to make a move. And I f- almost mm. feel like Messi is so good. He's just dribbles and dribbles and dribbles, waits for the defender to make a move and he is reacts to how they do, do you know, to how they obviously the moves yeah. they make. Just you can't it's so hard to kind of predict what he's gonna do. And I think that's why our defenders do struggle. And his penalty, to be fair to him, it seems odd to give someone credit for for a penalty. You expect the attacker to. But I think that I think it's something like he's missed 28% of the penalties he's ever taken, which is a really high figure. That's like more than one in four 
for a player of his sort of ability. But in a World Cup semi-final, when everything's on the line for him, really, the penalty was beautiful as well. Like, he took that incredibly well. So this really is does feel like it might be his moment, doesn't it? I don't want to jinx him. Well, I don't really know where I lie, where my priorities lie for this. I don't know if I want Argentina to win or if I want France to win. I think more. I, I think think exactly part of me wants Argentina to win because because France knocked us out. Um, <laughs> so I'm kind Bitter. of siding slightly towards. <laughs> but yeah, do you I know think, what? Yeah, the penalty was. I feel exactly the same with this game and I more feel bitter about the way that Argentina were in that Holland game. I just thought they were so awful at the end of it and mm. when Messi was, I talked about it on the last podcast when he was mad enough at Valtbergorst and they were slagging off Van Gaal who's literally like a dying man who's who's done really well. I really didn't like that and after that I thought, do you know what? I'd quite like to see you really crash and burn in that final. Let France come and absolutely spank them. It'd be hilarious to me, to be totally honest. Yeah, they do. And then at least you can say England went out to the eventual winners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Um, yeah, you know, there's reasons why I probably don't want either to win. And yeah, that like you mentioned there, their behaviour in that in that game against the Netherlands was awful. It was just so classless. Mm. We don't yeah. want to see that in football. But there is a lot of class to go around. And the big battle of this final, of course, will be the PSG men. And Mbappe against Messi, who's going to come out on top. This could really mark the coming of age of Mbappe, really. Who seems silly to say that, but he's already got a World Cup trophy to his name. But as we move away from that generation that we've had for so long of Ronaldo, Messi, Ronaldo, Messi, if Mbappe carries France through this World Cup again, is that kind of the end of the line for those two? And Mbappe is just the star now, and it's going to be all about him. Yeah, you you kind of feel that it is that sort of time where we're waiting for the next kind of big star to announce himself. And obviously, there's been mentions of Mbappe. He's kind of been in limbo of doing that um, in the le- in the last year, eighteen months. And Messi and Ronaldo have sort of obviously looked to be sort of coming to the the twilight end of their career and you've got to say he's gonna he's a great great player but I don't think he'll ever reach the heights of what Messi and Ronaldo um, gave us um, just mm. the levels and standards that they set was just truly ridiculous and um, mm. if it you know it, he's, he's a great player he's a really really good player He's got a long way to go if he wants to get at that level. And it's about maintain, maintaining that sort of consistency. Yeah. Um, not just doing Definitely. it for one or two seasons. Because we've seen players come and do that in the past. We've seen the likes of Kaká, mm. who was unbelievable for two or three seasons at Milan. Obviously, injuries got the better of him. It's really about kind of that longevity and being able to maintain that sort of form. And But yeah, it's, it'd be interesting to see who comes out on top. It's kind of... It, really is a, a match, you know, made in heaven, really. And it's set up perfectly to mm. see who who is going to obviously come out on top. <laughs> the old guard or and I the, actually uh, the think, prodigy. Yeah. yeah. And I actually think they've both got the perfect defence to play against in this game. Because against Morocco, if there's any player in the World Cup, well, against Morocco and against England, Mbappe was against Carl Walker and Ashraf Hakimi, probably the two fastest right backs in world football. The only people that would probably keep up with his playing style. Argentina's defence is not fast. And I do feel like Mbappe will get a lot of joy running in behind. And as I said against Morocco, France's defence didn't seem to like players running at them. So that's what Messi will do in this game. So we could actually see two teams set up to really benefit their star players. There's one other man that I want to mention really quickly. There is loose talk that Karen Benzema could be recalled for the final. He was never officially removed from the squad and he is fit now. That, would that be a bit of a slap in the face to some other players if Benzema got a place there? Or do you think it's kind of deserved for the career that he's had? Because obviously he's missed out on a lot of international football with France. Yeah, he has. And obviously he was dropped from the squad for a long time, wasn't he? Because of obviously some controversial mm. matters that were ongoing. So I feel in a way it would be a bit of a kick in the teeth 
the the likes of Giroud, who's been unbelievable for uh, France for so long, especially in this tournament. So I don't think it'd be the right thing oh. to do bring him in. Oh, don't get me wrong, he's a brilliant player. You know, but he's he would make. A yeah, game. I don't think it's the right thing to do, uh, and, and I just think it's you don't know. You don't know if he's 100% fit. So I imagine if they did bring him in, Giroud would still start and he might just be an option off the bench for the last 20 minutes if you need a goal. That, I look at that and think, I reckon I'd take that if I could. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, he's probably not going to be match fit. If he, he can't. Was it a muscle injury that he had? Was it hamstring? Yeah, um, yeah I think so. You don't want to, especially don't want to be Pushing players too far and bringing them back a little bit too early uh, with those certain injuries, mm. especially. So, yeah, it, I'm sure Deschamps would love to be in a position to be able to to do that with him, but I just think it would be the wrong thing to do. Personally, I think France have got more than enough talent to be able to 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 beat this Argentine team if everything goes their way and they've got all the players fit and not ill. And um, because if mm. They do have I think, quite a bit of illness in that team that could really sway, swing it in Argentina's um, favour, really, for me. It's so disappointing. So go on then. I'm going to press you for a score prediction. What are you, what are you expecting to see flash up at the end of, end of the game on Sunday? I'm I'm interested to see what this Argentina lineup is going to be because they have had a few tactical sort of tweaks, haven't they, over the last few games? I know yeah. against Croatia, didn't yeah. they start with four centre midfielders? Um, which obviously mm, pretty much. That they had to win. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see whether they start with Sandro Martinez at centre back or not, and drop Otamendi because I just feel like Otamendi is just so slow; he's not got the legs that he did have. Um, in his earlier days. I'd be surprised if they drop him. I can... Obviously, if they start playing Giroud, they'll probably want to deal with him. I, I don't know whether mm-hmm. they need both Romero and Otamendi to do that. I know that, mm. The thing is, Martinez, he reads the game really well. So if there are moments and transitional mm. moments where France are getting behind or looking to get in behind, he reads passes mm. and makes the interceptions. So... I know what you mean. I I, I think mm. I do think that they will go with Otamendi and Romero, <laughs> but I would like to see Martinez start. Um, Anyone that watches to, this very often United will United. notice something, Dave. <laughs> Whenever someone asks you for a score prediction or a prediction, you go, "I'm just going to talk about the game a little bit more and see if I can get away with not making my prediction here." But you're a bit of you always get it quite close. So I want I'm going to ask you, what are you going to go for with Sunday? Who's winning the game? I think it's going to go 1-1 one, one, and I think it's going to go extra time. And then I think that... Ah, this guy! <laughs> anything could happen. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to say Argentina will win it. I an extra time, late. actually. I had two all in extra time, but I think France in will take time. it. Um, so we'll be, we'll be interested to see where it goes. On the other side, on Saturday, it's worth mentioning two teams that have had great tournaments as well. There is the third versus fourth player. Morocco will take on Croatia. We've seen this game already in the tournament, which is always interesting because that was the same in the last tournament as well, if you remember, because it was England-Belgium. And obviously they played in the group as well. So it's impressive that that's followed suit again. Croatia were, as we said, pretty poor against Argentina, but generally have had a really good tournament they grew into the tournament. Their midfield looked absolutely exquisite. We'll see Modric one last time, we imagine, at a World Cup in this game. But on the other side, Morocco just didn't look tired. They looked like they still got energy despite a million players being injured. I think they're onto their eighth choice centre-back by now because everyone just kept going off injured for them. Who comes out on top of between these two in this last battle? I th- a lot of people say, obviously, you know, it's it's a game that doesn't matter. I still feel like it's going to yeah. be a big game for both sides for different reasons. You've got to think it's going to be Modric, like you mentioned, mm. it's Modric's last game. I don't think he'll want to go out on a loss. So there's going to be plenty of incentive there for him. And, uh, you know, Croatia, a very proud nation as well. They, they've they had a lot, obviously, a lot of success in the last two or three tournaments. Uh, you can't imagine they're going to be in the position to kind of let this one go. 
Um, so, but obviously the amount of support yeah, that definitely. Morocco have there, well, you can imagine it's going to be unbelievable. And um, to be obviously an African nation to finish third at a World mm. Cup would be you know, truly unbelievable. It's something that you couldn't imagine would have happened before the tournament even started. So, I just feel as though if Morocco can play the way they have done in the last couple of games, it's, it all depends whether they can be clinical in one or two moments, um, and maybe just have a bit of a bit of luck go for them because they they probably struggle with. Look, apart from the penalties, obviously, well, I don't know if that's making your own luck. In yeah, having brilliant penalties, brilliant, a brilliant goalkeeper on your side. Um, I'd I'd like to see Morocco win just because you know. Looking how, at both these sides, though, it's got nil nil, and one of them taking it on penalties written all over it, hasn't it? Because neither of them have really got that striker of that kind of quality. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw that at all. I feel feel like it's going to be a bit of a damp squid of an affair. And yeah, I don't want to say that. We'll get the good, the good game on Sunday. That it's a good game. <laughs> um, I like to. Ha- I think the one thing about yeah. Morocco as well, they've got so many talented mm. players in there that you don't. There's so many players that are dangerous. Like you don't. It almost felt like when in the game against, um, in the game against France, that they France didn't really know how to pick up because there was so much movement in those attacking. The likes of Anahi, who has been an absolute revelation this tournament. Well, he's apparently got every club in Europe after him now. Um, <laughs> but the the, emo- the movement that they mm. sort of created, it was just kind of mesmerising at times. And I think that's just because they've got so many technically talented players in there. It was actually... Um, I didn't know a lot about Morocco before the tournament. and mm, Definitely. Like, this has kind of been a brush. Well, breath we've got pressure. one weekend left of the tournament. So, then we'll be back, I'm sure, to review that, that weekend's football and talk about maybe our team of the tournament and players that have impressed us the, the most. But after waiting four long years, in fact, longer than four years this time, four and a half years, the World Cup's nearly over, Dave. I hope you'll enjoy the final and anyone watching this will too. Thank you for watching us. We'll be back again soon, of course. If you like what you've seen throughout this World Cup, please drop us a like on this video and, of course, subscribe to the channel. That'd be fantastic. We'll be back for the final and then again once the Premier League kicks back up as well. Plenty of football to go around for us. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me today, Dave, and we'll see you again another time. Thanks, guys.